If a man dies, shall he live again? What does it mean to be absent from the body and present with the Lord? Did Jesus go with a thief to paradise on Good Friday? Did the souls of dead people really cry out from below the altar? Pastor Bohr answers these questions and more in the amazing series Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our Father and our God, what a joy it is to be in your presence. And Father, as we study tonight about the thief on the cross and the witch of Endor, we ask that you will help us to learn the lessons that will be useful for us, especially as we near the end of time. And we thank you, Father, for the assurance of your presence because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. In this seminar we are studying some puzzling texts on the subject of the state of the dead. And in the subject that we're going to study today we are going to take a look at two stories that we find in the Bible. One story is found in the New Testament and the other one is found in the Old Testament. The first one we're going to deal with is the story of the thief on the cross. And the second one is dealing with the story of the witch of Endor. So let's get right into our study and turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 23 and verses 32 and 33. Probably most of you know that when Jesus was crucified, two men were crucified as well on either side of Jesus. They were actually criminals, they were malefactors. And so let's read about these two thieves that were crucified, one on the right and one on the left hand side of Jesus. It says there, there were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Now it just so happens that the criminal that was on the left side was impenitent. He was unrepentant. Whereas the one who was on the right side actually repented according to Scripture. Let's read about this in Luke chapter 23 and verses 39 to 43. Luke 23, 39 to 43. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, that is Jesus, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now that last verse, verse 43, has been the source of much controversy. Because Jesus seems to be indicating here that the thief was going to be in paradise with him that very day. Once again, verse 43, and I'm reading from the New King James Version, says, And Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The question is, is this really what Jesus was teaching? Well, there are several factors that we need to take into account as we look at the meaning of this specific verse, verse 43. First of all, it's very important for us to realize that the Greek writings of the times of Christ did not have any punctuation marks. In other words, they did not have question marks, exclamation marks, they didn't have periods and commas, etc. All of these punctuation marks have been added by the translators. 
So basically the translators from the Greek to the English or whatever other language have placed the punctuation marks where they feel that they should belong. Now there are two ways in which you can understand this verse. It all depends on where you place a comma. We've already noticed first of all that the translation that we just read says verily verily I say unto thee today you will be with me in paradise. So in other words the comma is placed after the word thee or you. But there's another way of looking at this. There's another place where you can put the comma. And then it would say, Verily, verily, I say unto thee today, you will be with me in paradise. In other words, the comma would go after the word today. So Jesus is saying, today I am telling you that you will be with me in paradise. Or the comma could be, Verily I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now somebody might say, well, then it's a matter of subjective opinion. You know, you say it's supposed to go after the word uh, today, and other people say that it's supposed to be after the word you. So how do we know who is right? Well, the fact is we need to look at several factors that clearly indicate that Jesus and the thief did not go to paradise that very day. The first thing that we want to notice is the location of paradise. Where is paradise located? Where Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. Let's go in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 2 to 4. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking about a man that he knew many years before. He's probably referring to himself. And he speaks about this person being taken to the third heaven. It says there in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 2, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, by the way this means I don't know whether he went there in person or he was there in vision, like John in the book of Revelation, you know he was taken to the presence of God, his body was on Patmos, but his mind was taken up to see the new Jerusalem. And he continues saying in verse 3, actually let's go back to, ver uh, to the beginning, it says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven, remember that, he was caught up to the third heaven, and I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I do not know, God knows. Now notice this, how he was caught up into paradise, and heard inexpressible words which it is not lawful for man to utter. So you'll notice here that the third heaven is the place where paradise is located, because the Apostle Paul says that this man was taken to the third heaven, then he says that he was caught up to paradise. Paradise is in the third heaven. So the question is, what is the third heaven? Well, obviously if there's a third heaven there must be a second and a first. So the question is, what is the first heaven? Go with me to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 8. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 8. Speaking about the first heaven that refers to the atmosphere where the birds fly. It says, and God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. So notice the firmament is called heaven. That's the first heaven where the birds fly. The second heaven is where the stars are. Notice Genesis chapter 15 and verse 5 as an example of this second heaven. It's the heaven where the stars and the planets are found. It says there, God is speaking here uh, to Abraham, then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. So God told Abraham to look towards the heaven. Obviously he's talking about the starry heaven. That is the second heaven of Scripture. Now where is the third heaven? The third heaven is actually the place where God dwells. It's where the New Jerusalem is. It's beyond the sun, the moon, and the stars in deep space somewhere. Now you say, how do we know that? Well, let's examine some verses. Go with me to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. 
Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. I want you to notice where the tree of life is located. It says there in Revelation 2 verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, now notice this, the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Question, where is the tree of life located? It is located in the midst of the paradise of God. Is that the same place that the Apostle Paul was referring to in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? Absolutely. Now, the question is, where is the tree of life located in the paradise of God? Where is that paradise of God? Go with me to Revelation chapter 22 and verses 1 and 2. Revelation 22 and verses 1 and 2. Here John, in vision, says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. What is there? The throne of God and of the Lamb. That's the presence of God, in other words. Verse 2, in the middle of its street, which street? Which city? The New Jerusalem, right? In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now let's put it all together. The third heaven is where paradise is. The tree of life is in paradise. And paradise is where the throne of God is found in the New Jerusalem. So the question is, where is the paradise that Jesus was referring to when He said to this thief that He would be with Him in paradise? It was not some intermediary place. It was in the New Jerusalem, where the throne of God is, where the tree of life is. In other words, it was in the very presence of God. So if Jesus was promising this thief that he was going to be in paradise, he was saying, you're going to be in the new Jerusalem, you're going to be before the throne of God, where the tree of life is found. By the way, we also want to read Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14, where it speaks once again about the location of the tree of life. The tree of life is inside the gates of the holy city, of the new Jerusalem, in the very presence of God. Here it says, Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. Now unfortunately, during the intertestamental period, that's the period between the Old and the New Testament, actually between when the Old Testament ended and John the Baptist began his preaching, the Jews developed a very strange tradition about paradise. Basically they came up with the idea that paradise was kind of like a holding place where people went for a while before they actually entered the presence of God. You know Protestants have picked up that idea and basically they've taught that all of the saints of the Old Testament before Jesus died their souls went off to paradise and they were held there in paradise until Jesus resurrected and then they were introduced into the very presence of God. Now the question is, does that square with the teaching of Scripture? Absolutely not. Because we already noticed that the third heaven is where paradise is. And where paradise is, is in the New Jerusalem where the tree of life is and where the throne of God and the Lamb is found. And so very clearly, Jesus was not saying to the thief, you're going to go to some intermediary place, your soul is going to go to this place, and then you're going to be introduced in the presence of God. He was saying, if Jesus was saying that it was going to happen that very day, He was saying, this very day you are going to be with me in the presence of God. If you translate the verse the way that the New King James and the King James have it translated, which I believe is the wrong translation. Now, the question, the question that we need to ask now is where did Jesus go when He died? According to the Bible. Did He go to this place called Paradise? Yes, He, he might have gone to Paradise, do you think? I don't think so. You say, how do you know? Because the Bible tells us. Go with me to Acts chapter 2 verses 25 to 27. 
Acts chapter 2, 25 to 27. This is speaking here, uh, actually Peter is speaking on the day of Pentecost, and he's speaking about Jesus using a messianic prophecy that's found in Psalm 16 and verse 10. For David says concerning him, that is concerning Jesus, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for He is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. Here Jesus is speaking messianically in Psalm 16 and verse 10, about a thousand years before this event takes place. And then notice verse 27, For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Now I want you to notice the synonymous parallelism in this verse. Actually verse 27, For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Do you see the parallel? My soul is parallel to your Holy One. And the word Hades is in parallel construct with corruption. Now I'd like to read this verse as it's found in the New International Version because it's more accurate in its meaning. The New International Version, Acts 2 and verse 27 says this, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon, now notice, me in other words the soul is Jesus, you will not abandon me to where? To the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One, which is the me, neither will you allow your Holy One to see decay. So the question is, where did Jesus go when He died? Did He go to paradise? Did He go to the presence of God in the New Jerusalem before the throne where the tree of life is? Absolutely not. Acts 2 verse 27 tells us very clearly that he went to the grave and that God was not going to abandon him in the grave. Now we need to ask another question. Did the thief even die that very day? Notice John chapter 19 and verses 31 to 34. John 19 and verses 31 to 34. It says there, Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate, notice this, that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. So were the thieves dead on that day when Jesus died? Absolutely not. Let's continue, verse 32. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. So the question is, were the thieves dead that day on their crosses? Absolutely not. When they came to where Jesus was, Jesus was dead, but the thieves were still alive. By the way, at what hour of the day did Jesus die? Notice Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46, and we'll read through verse 50. Matthew 27 verse 46 through 50. It says here, and about the ninth hour, by the way the ninth hour is about three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, the first hour would be six o'clock in the morning. So they calculated time just a little different than we do. So it says about the ninth hour, which is three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. At what time did Jesus die? He died at the ninth hour, which would be about three o'clock in the afternoon. 
were the thieves dead at three o'clock in the afternoon? Absolutely not. In fact there are cases that are known to have taken place in Rome where thieves and uh, malefactors were crucified and they actually lived for days after their crucifixion. And so the thieves were not dead that day and therefore the penitent thief could not have gone with Jesus that very day to paradise. Furthermore I want us to notice Luke 23 and verse 42. Luke 23 and verse 42. When is it that the thief wanted Jesus to remember him uh, so that he could be with Jesus? Was it at the moment of death or was it at some future moment? Notice Luke 23 verse 42. Then he said to Jesus, Lord remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now the question is when did Jesus come into his kingdom? Did Jesus come into his kingdom that very day? Absolutely not. We know from scripture that Jesus did not ascend to heaven to take over the kingdom along with his father to sit at the right hand of his father until 40 days after the resurrection according to Acts chapter 1. So in other words Jesus did not enter his kingdom that day. And so the thief could not have entered that kingdom with Jesus on that very day. Another thing that we want to notice is uh, according to John chapter 20 and verse 1 Jesus resurrected the first day of the week. Notice John chapter 20 and verse 1. It says on the first day of the week Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So very clearly Jesus resurrects on the first day of the week. And yet we're going to find something very interesting in that same chapter in verse 17 Jesus had something very interesting to say. Notice John chapter 20 and verse 17. Jesus saith unto her, that is to Mary, touch me not for I am not yet ascended to my father but go to my brethren and say unto them I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Interesting that on resurrection morning Jesus is saying to Mary the first day of the week he's saying I have not yet ascended to my father. So how could Jesus on Friday have gone to paradise to the very presence of the throne of his father if the day of the resurrection he says I have not yet ascended to my father. By the way Jesus must have ascended that very day at least for a moment and then come back. Because we're told in Luke chapter 24 and verse 39 that that evening Jesus encouraged his followers to touch him. It says there in Luke 24 verse 39, Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Handle me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. So there are all sorts of reasons why Jesus did not go with the thief to paradise that very day. First of all we notice that the thief probably did not die that very day. Secondly Jesus did not enter his kingdom on that very day. Furthermore Jesus the third day said I have not yet ascended to my father. And we notice that paradise is the place where God the Father's throne is found in the New Jerusalem where the tree of life is. So on that day Jesus didn't go to paradise and the thief did not go to paradise either. So how should we translate this verse in Luke chapter 23? On the basis of all of the evidence that we've looked at there's no doubt that it should be translated Verily, verily I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise. In other words today I'm telling you that someday you will be with me in paradise when I enter my kingdom. By the way this was an idiomatic way of speaking among the Jews. Notice for example Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 18. 
it says there and it's not talking about the same topic but I want you to see that it was common for the Jews to say today something was going to happen in the future it says there in Deuteronomy 30 verse 18 I announce to you today that you shall surely perish you shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess so notice once again the same idea I announce to you today that you shall surely perish they weren't going to perish that very day but God was saying that day that they would in the future perish and so this text has no foundation for teaching that the soul of that man and the soul of Jesus went together to paradise that very day the fact is the thief wasn't dead and Jesus went to the grave Jesus did not go to paradise Jesus did not actually go to the presence of his father until the third day when he finally said that evening now you can touch me now we need to go to the second episode that we're going to study this evening and that's the story of the witch of Endor it's found in 1st Samuel chapter 28 1st Samuel chapter 28 let me give you just a little bit of background it seems like King Saul had been more concerned about persecuting David than he had been about administrating the kingdom wisely and as a result he had ignored the Philistines and the Philistines had become very powerful and had taken over much of the kingdom that had belonged to Israel you see Saul was so obsessed with getting rid of David that he simply ignored the kingdom and he did not spend any time administrating it and defending it from the hands of the Philistines and so we find in 1st Samuel chapter 28 and verse 5 that Saul was very much concerned and worried about the progress and the growth of the Philistines it says there when Saul saw the army of the Philistines he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly and so Saul wanted to have the assurance that somehow he was going to be delivered from the hands of the Philistines now there were normal ways in which he could have consulted the Lord to find out if uh, when the Philistines came against him he was going to be delivered notice 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 6 1 Samuel 28 and verse 6 it says and when Saul inquired of the Lord the Lord did not answer him notice the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets in other words God did not use any of the conventional ways of communicating his will to King Saul which was prophets and visions and the Urim and the Thummim God simply chose not to answer Saul now it's interesting to notice that at this point the prophet Samuel had died and he had been buried notice 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 3 1 Samuel 28 and verse 3 it says now Samuel had died and all Israel had lamented for him notice and buried him not only his body him buried him and in his own city and Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land so notice that Samuel had died and he had been buried and God did not answer Saul by any of the conventional means and then we find in this story that suddenly a being appears to Saul who purportedly is the spirit of Samuel who had died and been buried now I want to share with you several reasons why this was not really Samuel first reason the Bible tells us very clearly that the living know that they are going to die but the dead know absolutely nothing notice Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verses 5 and 6 Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verses 5 and 6 it says there for the living know that they will die but the dead know 
nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So in other words, the dead don't know anything. So if the dead don't know anything, how could it be Samuel who was appearing from among the dead to King Saul? It would have been absolutely impossible. Besides, would God violate the very means that He had used to communicate with His people and use a method that He Himself had forbidden? Would God use forbidden methods when He could have used the methods that He approved of? Absolutely not. In fact, let's notice that God had strictly forbidden Israel from try to, trying to communicate with the dead. Notice Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 27. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 27. A man or a woman who is a medium, today they call them channelers, or who has familiar spirits, shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones, their blood shall be upon them. Notice the punishment for people who tried to communicate with the dead. In other words, they were to be put to death, they were to be stoned. Not only the medium who claimed to communicate with the dead, but also those who communicated with the dead. Notice Leviticus 19 and verse 31. This is another text that speaks about God's forbidding this method. Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. In other words, God had forbidden strictly this idea of trying to communicate with the dead. And here Saul wants to have Samuel who had died and been buried come to speak to him. Would God have allowed Samuel to go and speak to Saul when God had forbidden these methods and he could have used one of the conventional methods? Absolutely not. In fact Saul knew that what he was doing was wrong. Notice 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 9. 1 Samuel 28 and verse 9. Saul had actually done what the Lord had told him to do and they just cast out all of these uh, witches and all of these wizards from the land. It says there in verse 9 of 1 Samuel 28, Then the woman said to him, Look, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cur cause me to die? You see, Saul knew that the method that he was using was wrong. In fact, in 1 Samuel 28 verses 7 and 8, we find that Saul even disguised himself to try and fool this woman. It says there, Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. Notice he's not inquiring of the Lord, he's inquiring of her. And his servants said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes. Did he know that what he was doing was wrong and against God's will? Sure. Would God answer him by a method that was contrary to his will? Absolutely not. So it says in verse 8, So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes, and he went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman how? See, he wants to hide what he's doing. He came to the woman by night, and he said, Please conduct a seance for me, and bring me up, bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Now it's interesting to notice in verse 11, if you go with me to verse 11, what uh, the woman uh, asks King Saul. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. What do you mean bring me up Samuel? Was Samuel a good man? Of course he was. In fact he's on the honor roll we're going to notice in Hebrews chapter 11 of those who are going to resurrect in the better resurrection. So the question is, uh, where was Samuel at that point? We already read it. Samuel had died and he was what? He was buried. Now if he was good and the soul is really immortal like many people believe, then his soul should have not gone down, his soul should have gone where? His soul should have gone up. 
But obviously there's something strange going on here because Saul is saying, bring me up Samuel. In other words, Samuel did not go to be in the presence of the Lord. By the way, I want you to notice what the woman actually sees when this entity comes up from the earth. Notice 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 13. 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 13. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit. You know this is not a proper translation. This is the New King James. In the King James Version it says, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Notice, ascending out of the earth. So what was Samuel doing down there in the earth if, if he, he was a good man? His soul should have been at least in paradise up there somewhere. But she's making him come up. And you'll notice that she says, I see a spirit. Actually it's the Hebrew word Elohim which is translated God in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In other words this, this a witch is actually telling Saul, I see a God coming up out of the earth. In other words she was saying that Samuel was a what? Samuel was a God when he died. Now where does that lie come from? Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5. The devil said the same thing to Adam and Eve. Actually to Eve it says in verse 4, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Notice, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, you're not going to die, you're going to be like God. Is this the same thing that uh, the witch and the devil are trying to pan off to King Saul? Absolutely. Now, another thing which is very interesting is found in verse 14 of chapter 28. 1 Samuel 28 and verse 14. I want you to notice this very interesting. It says, So he said to her, What is his form? And I said, What does this entity look like? And she said, An old man is coming up. Oh, so if this is the soul of Samuel, then the soul of Samuel's pretty old, huh? Huh. And he is covered with a what? He is covered with a mantle. Those of you who have read about spiritualism know that this is the way that spirits supposedly used to appear to the living at seances. And now notice, and this is very important, because this witch has said that she saw gods ascending from the earth. Notice Saul's reaction. It says, and Saul perceived that it was Samuel, we'll come back to that a little bit later, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. What is he doing? He's worshiping this entity. That's correct. Because the witch has said, I saw Elohim. I saw gods coming up from the earth. So he bowed down, bows down and he worships. By the way, even angels do not receive worship. In Revelation chapter 19 verse 10, the angel Gabriel appears to John, and John falls at his feet to worship him, and the angel says, get up! I am a servant of God just like you are. You remember when Peter went uh, uh, and met Cornelius. Uh, you know, Cornelius bowed before him, and Peter said, get up! I'm a man such as you are. So how is it that Saul is bowing and putting his face to the ground before this entity? Another interesting detail is what we find in 1 Samuel 28 and verse 19. See all of these discrepancies show that there's something strange going on here that really this was not Samuel who appeared to Saul. 1 Samuel 28 and verse 19. Notice what this supposed spirit of Samuel has to say. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. Notice this. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. Huh. What is it that, that, that this uh, 
suppose Samuel is saying? He's saying, you know, tomorrow, Saul, you're going to be in the very same place that I'm at. So what does that mean? The righteous and the wicked all go to the same place? That's what modern spiritualism teaches. Universalism. The idea that everyone is going to be saved. Everybody's going to the same place. That's what's happening here. And so he says, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. By the way, that could not have been Samuel, because the Bible tells us that Samuel is on the honor roll of Hebrews chapter 11, and his hope was found in being with God at that better resurrection. In fact, let's read that in Hebrews 11 verse 32, the name of Samuel is mentioned, it says, and what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, also of David, and Samuel, and the prophets. And then I want you to notice verse 35, after mentioning all of these names, it says, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a what? A better resurrection. So let me ask you, when is it that Samuel is actually going to be raised up and be present with the Lord? It was not at the moment of his death that he comes up and he speaks to Saul. The Bible makes it very clear that it will be at the moment of the better resurrection when Jesus comes on the clouds of heaven and you hear the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the archangel that will call Samuel from the grave. Meanwhile, the Bible tells us that Samuel is like everybody else who has died. He knows absolutely nothing. By the way, we know that the entity that came up and spoke to Saul was not Samuel, because in 1 Chronicles chapter 10 verses 13 and 14, if you go with me there, 1 Chronicles chapter 10 verses 13 and 14, we're told that the Lord did not answer Saul, because Saul did not inquire of the Lord. It says there in 1 Chronicles 10, 13 and 14, So Saul died for his unfaithfulness which he had committed against the Lord, because he did not keep the word of the Lord. And also, notice, because he consulted a medium for guidance. But he did not inquire of the Lord. Therefore he killed him and turned the kingdom over to David the son of Jesse. Let me ask you, when Saul used the medium to try and communicate with the Lord, was it the Lord who answered him? Absolutely not. We're told here that he did not inquire of the Lord. And if he did not inquire of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, especially using unorthodox, forbidden methods of de determining the will of God. By the way, Isaiah chapter 8 and verses 19 and 20 tells us that we are not supposed to seek the will of God through these forbidden methods, but rather by going to the very Word of God. It says there in Isaiah 8, 19 and 20, and when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. In other words, we are to seek the will of God in the law, in this time when Isaiah wrote, that is the writings of Moses, and the testimony refers to the prophets who had been raised up by God and who had written up till that point, because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So basically this is saying, don't seek God's will among the mediums and the wizards, but to the law and to the testimony. And if they don't speak according to this, it's because they have no light in them. Now, I want you to notice a very important word that is used in 1 Samuel 28 and verse 14. 1 Samuel 28 and verse 14. You know that you read the passage and the passage gives the impression that it's Samuel that is actually speaking all throughout the passage. But there's a very important word that indicates that this was Saul's perception. 
Notice 1 Samuel 28 and verse 14. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his. Now let me ask you, what were Saul's perceptions like at this point? Were his perceptions trustworthy? Absolutely not. Notice 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 14. Chapter 16 and verse 14. It says here, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So what was the problem with Saul before this Witch of Endor episode? The Bible tells us that there was a spirit, an evil spirit, it says from the Lord that tormented him. Does this mean that God goes around sending evil spirits to torment people? Of course not. You know how this worked. You have for example Job. You know the devil comes and he takes everything away from Job. Job thinks it's the Lord. He says the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But as we read the story we know that the Lord is simply permitting the devil to work. Another example of this is in 1st Chronicles chapter 18 verses 18 through 20. I'll just have you look up that passage where uh, a spirit appears before the presence of the Lord and he says, you know, I'll go convince Ahab to go to battle so that he gets killed in battle. And the Lord says to this spirit, he says, and how are you going to convince him to go to battle? And the spirit says, oh I'll be a lying spirit in the mouths of all of his prophets. In other words, I'll tell a lie to his prophets that he's going to gain the victory in the battle, but he's really going to be, be killed. Now let me ask you, who was that spirit who was in the presence of the Lord that said, I will be a lying spirit in the mouths of all of the prophets of Ahab? It can't be a loyal angel. It can't be a good spirit, a ministering spirit from the, from the Lord for the simple reason that angels do not use what? They do not use lies to accomplish God's purposes. So in other words, Saul perceived that it was Samuel. But the Bible tells us that Saul's powers of perception were skewed because an evil spirit was coming and was tormenting Saul. And, and in fact the Bible tells us that David would be called by Saul to play his harp so his tortured spirit were ex would experience some peace. And even when David was playing his harp you know what would happen, the evil spirit would take possession of Saul and at least a couple of times he took his spear and he hurled it at David to try and nail David to the wall according to scripture. Let me ask you, who had possessed Saul at this point? It was the devil. So could Saul trust his perceptions? Absolutely not. He perceived that it was Samuel, but that doesn't mean that it was Samuel. In fact, I want to read a statement from the devotional book Conflict and Courage, page 172, where Ellen White is discussing this experience of the witch of Endor, and she says this, When Saul inquired for Samuel, the Lord did not cause Samuel to appear to Saul. He saw nothing. Satan was not allowed to disturb the rest of Samuel in the grave and bring him up in reality to the witch of Endor. God does not give Satan power to resurrect the dead, but Satan's angels, listen to this, assume the form of dead friends and speak and act like them that through professed dead friends he can better carry on his work of deception. Satan knew Samuel well. Now notice, Satan knew Samuel well. And he knew how to represent him before the witch of Endor and to utter correctly the fate of Saul and his sons. I'd like to read another statement that we find in Great Controversy, page 552. Here Ellen White is talking about what's going to happen in the future. The devil is going to do the same thing that he did to Saul at the end of time. To try and deceive people into believing what he's trying to teach through these supposed spirits of the dead. It says there, speaking about the devil, he has power to bring before men the appearance of their departed friends. 
the counterfeit is perfect. That's amazing. The counterfeit is perfect. The familiar look, the words, the tone are reproduced with marvelous distinctness. Many are comforted with the assurance that their loved ones are enjoying the bliss of heaven and without suspicion of danger they give ear to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That is a powerful statement. So something is appearing, but it's not the loved ones. It's really the devil disguised as those who died. Let me ask you, does the devil know a lot about the lives of those people who have died? Absolutely. Now I want to read an amazing statement as we near our close in Patriarchs and Prophets page 687. Say, how did the devil know that Saul was going to be killed the next day? Well the fact is it wasn't the Lord who killed him. It, the Lord allowed the devil to kill him, right? So when it says that he killed him, it simply means that God withdrew his protection from Saul. Because Saul was in the hands of the devil at that point. Saul was demon possessed. So the devil could do anything he wanted to him. His door of probation, so to speak, had closed. Now how can the devil sometimes apparently predict the future? Things that are going to happen in the future. How does, how does he say certain things about people that no one else knows? You know how you have these psychics on television uh, who supposedly communicate with the dead. You know people call, they say, hey, you know I want you to communicate with such and such a relative. And they say some amazing things about the relatives that are really true. And you say, how do they know these things? Well the fact is, the devil knows all about those relatives. And he can come and he can whisper in the ear of the psychic to tell the psychic exactly what transpired in the life of that person. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now lo look at this statement, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 687. Satan leads men to consult those that have familiar spirits. And by revealing hidden things of the past. Does Satan know the past of everyone on planet earth and his angels? Sure, because he can go even into the secret places. Satan leads men to consult those that have familiar spirits and by revealing hidden things of the past he inspires confidence in his power to foretell things to come. Because he says things in the past that nobody knew except that person. People say, well if he knows the past then he must also know the future. Now how does he do this? By experience gained through the long ages he can reason from cause to effect and often forecast with a degree of accuracy some of the future events of man's life just by looking at the law of cause and effect. Thus he is enabled to deceive poor misguided souls and bring them under his power and lead them captive at his will. You know there was one, pro one prophet that probably all of you have heard about. Her name is Jean Dixon. She actually passed away. Do you know that she prophesied with precision where Robert Kennedy was going to be assassinated and the month in which Robert Kennedy was going to be assassinated? She said it several months before. So you say, she had to be a psychic. She had to have the gift of reading the future because she predicted that Robert F. Kennedy was going to be killed in the Ambassador Hotel in the month of June. Only God can foretell the future, right? How did the devil do it? Do you think the devil knew that uh, Robert F. Kennedy was going to be in the Ambassador Hotel at that date? Do you think he knew Robert F. Kennedy's uh, calendar? Of course he did. Could the devil influence somebody to take a gun and to come and to meet Robert, Robert Kennedy at the Ambassador Hotel. Of course he could. And so he has Gene Dixon predict this is, this is going to happen and then he molds the different events so that it will happen. The only trouble is it doesn't happen 100% of the time because sometimes God intervenes and he interferes with the devil's plans and he does not allow the devil to implement his plans. Are you understanding what I'm saying? 
And so people say, wow, she predicted the, 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 the death of Robert F. Kennedy. That's amazing. But what they don't realize is that she's not really predicting anything. It's the fact of the devil revealing what he is planning to do. He can't always do what he plans to do because sometimes God interrupts his plans. Now there's a lot of spiritualism going on in the world today. Harry Potter, supposed apparitions of the Virgin Mary, psychics, astrologers, palm readers, channelers, supposedly angels, you know that most people believe that angels are spirits of the departed that went to heaven and then they come back to this earth disguised as human beings to help those who are here on earth you know like the program Highway to Heaven with Michael Landon probably you, you watched that show, it was a long time ago where you know he died, he went to heaven, then God sent him, sent him back, he became an angel, God sent him back to earth to help people as a human being. The devil is working overtime to deceive the whole world with the lie that he uttered at the very beginning of human history. The, the living know that they will die, the Bible says, but the dead know not anything. But the devil says, you will not surely die, but you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. The question is, who do we believe? Do we believe God, or do we believe the devil? That's the question that each of us have to answer. And so, the two passages that we've studied make it very clear that neither one of them teach the immortality of the soul. The thief on the cross did not go that very day to paradise with Jesus because Jesus did not go to paradise that day and the thief wasn't dead that day. So the better translation is, Verily, verily, I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. And as far as the story of the witch of Endor, God did not communicate with Saul through Samuel. Samuel is in the grave, dead, awaiting the call of Jesus Christ, his Savior and Lord, whom he believed in uh, as the one who would come in the future to shed his blood to save Samuel and all the rest of humanity through his blood from their sins. And so folks, the book of Revelation tells us that in the last days the devil is going to deceive the whole world. I pray to God that none of us will be deceived.